So is, is, you started the recording? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. Uh, well, thanks um, uh, everyone for, for joining. Uh, and it's uh, my pleasure today to uh, introduce Jenny Levine, who's from uh, Emory University. Uh, and uh, she's going to talk to us uh, about uh, how COVID-19 may turn into the common sniffles, population biological and immunological perspective. Uh, as usual, if you uh, put questions into the Q&A, uh, as you go along, um, then they'll get asked at the end. And if anyone has a sort of, um, you know, a point they want to uh, make um, verbally, then you can be unmuted at the end. So, um, uh, yeah, so we'll have the questions at the end of this, rather than uh, through the seminar. Brilliant. Over to Jenny. Great. Uh, thanks, George, so much for having me and to all of you for being here. And I'm excited to share a little bit about the work that we've done and, and what we're thinking a little bit about what we're thinking about at the moment. Um, so everybody in the world, I think, is aware of COVID-19. And right now it is severe and causing all kinds of health burdens, but there is this possibility that we sort of explore through this or that we came to through doing this study that it may in the end actually be to in the human population in the future, no worse than a common cold. So I'm gonna um, explore how we got to that conclusion. My cat is gonna help me. Um, and so we're looking, we're gonna take a look at the immunology of the interactions between coronaviruses and the human immune system. And then sort of the population biology and demographics of, of ages of infection and, and age specific severity. This work was done in conjunction with uh, Otar Bjornstad at Penn State and Rustam Antia also at Emory. Let's see. Oh, there we go. Okay, so how much do coronaviruses impact human health? Right now we have this COVID-19 pandemic ravaging the globe, and then we also have another six human coronaviruses that have some degree of human-to-human -human transmission. Four of them are fully endemic. Um, two alpha coronaviruses, NL63 and 229E, and two beta coronaviruses, HKU1 and OC43. And notice that, so this is the number of total deaths that have been calculated, uh, estimated from these different coronaviruses. And notice that it's on a log scale. So down here for this, for, for three of the endemic coronaviruses, we actually haven't established any particular deaths that I know of. There may be the occasional one. For OC43, there was a breakout in a nursing home that led to, that was identified as OC43 was the cause of those eight deaths. But in general, these four circulate all the time. Everybody is infected with them and there's very, very, very little disease burden from them. In contrast, there's three different coronaviruses that have emerged in the human population in the past 20 or so years. Um, the first was SARS-CoV-1, which uh, killed around a thousand people and was then eradicated. Um, then there was, and then MERS, Mid-Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, which continues to circulate a little bit in certain populations, but the transmission of it is dependent on, there is some human to human transmission, but, this, but sustaining it in the population requires an animal reservoir of camels. And so it doesn't spread very widely. And, and here again, we, we have somewhere around order of magnitude, a thousand deaths in total from this coronavirus. COVID-19, which has been with us for just over a year, we're already um, topping a million deaths. So something very different is going on here. And from this, it looks like COVID-19 is miles away from these other coronaviruses and much worse. However, what we see is that a lot of what happened with these other two that emerged, SARS-CoV-1 and MERS, was just that they were, they're actually much more severe. So the infection fatality ratio, they're much more severe if you get them, but they were controlled quickly. So MERS, like I said, mostly requires this animal reservoir. And so it doesn't spread widely, though it's still around. And SARS-CoV-1, we managed to actually uh, contain completely. So COVID-19, when you look at it in comparison with these two, is actually quite a mild disease, but it spreads hugely, as we know, and that leads to these massive, massive deaths. So what will it look like in the future? What will the future burden of SARS-CoV-2 be? 
I think at this point, most people agree that the idea that we will be able to eliminate it or even locally eradicate, so eliminate it like we did SARS or even locally contain it like we did with MERS is unlikely. I mean, certainly we can't, it's already globally spread. So if we're able to locally contain it, it would not be the way we did with MERS at the beginning or with SARS at the beginning of its spread. It would have to be somehow more like a mass vaccine campaign that is uh, raining it raining it in and that may or may not happen but certainly these first it's already spread globally so we then ask the question well what are what is it going to be like in the future what will we need to do is it going to be something that's going to be around forever like the flu and we just need to have lots of boosters for it will it be like measles and just children have to keep getting vaccinated into the future um so here's here's one quote from from about a month ago that kind of gives us an idea of what some thoughts out there are and and we're going to sort of examine whether these seem like the right directions to go. Prominent voices, including that of the health secretary, have told us that COVID-19 will become a seasonal infection, much like flu. But our public health approach should be more akin to measles. The UK should be aiming to suppress and eliminate COVID-19 through vaccines, mass testing, and supported after isolation. After we've achieved this, the UK should then help poorer countries in their vaccination efforts. So this is a perspective that suggests we can suppress and eliminate COVID-19 through vaccines and that that's what we should be trying to do. Um, not so much like the flu where vaccines are more used to help protect vulnerable individuals. Is that possible? Let's take a look at what makes COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 different from other infections and how its specific biology and interactions with the human immune system might inform whether we really can suppress and eliminate it and how necessary that is. So I first wanna present this model of immunity uh, that suggests that immunity is not an all or none thing. It's more like a dimmer switch. So we, we generate a differential equation model of transmission, but within that model of transmission, there's a model of how immunity works. And the way that immunity works is that someone is naive at the beginning, so they're immunologically naive. And as of a year ago, that was, with regard to SARS-CoV-2, that was the entire global population. Everybody was immunologically naive. So people start off being naive, they get, infected or possibly this line could also represent vaccination but in our model we're really looking at infection they get infected and they get this very strong type of immunity that can possibly possibly even sterilizing immunity so transmission reduction or possibly even transmission elimination so you're not even susceptible and with time immunity wanes but it's not it's not just a an up and down kind of light switch it sort of dims. And so as immunity wanes, you might be able to get a, a mild infection where the virus replicates a little bit, you have the possibility of transmitting a little bit, and disease is very much reduced. And we, we following in the vaccine efficacy literature um, on Betts Halloran's work with uh, vaccine VEs, so vaccine efficacy with regard to susceptibility, infectiousness, and pathology, we think about immune efficacy. So this, we are really looking at immune efficacy following an infection, though possibly we're also, of course, interested in how these relate to vaccines, but the model is looking at this immune efficacy with regard to susceptibility, so that's sterilizing immunity, infectiousness, which says you might transmit, but not as much, and pathology, which says you might have less disease. And so we looked at data from a number of the endemic coronaviruses. And now we have some preliminary data from SARS-CoV-2. And there's sort of two key things that, that inform this model for us. For one thing, there seems to be a short period when reinfection is unlikely, and that seems to last about a year. Uh, and this, th these data from the endemic coronaviruses, uh, there are, there are, and I'm going to show you some specific data from a, an experimental reinfection study. There's also data. Uh, there's been some surveillance with like weekly PCR swabs, 
And um, this was done in New York City uh, by Galanti and Shaman. And they again find these fairly rapid reinfections, also data in serology uh, by serospikes that suggest these reinfections within a year is not uncommon among the endemic coronaviruses. And then from the, and I'm going to show you a little bit more of these data, from the experimental infection studies, we do see that upon reinfection, viral shedding seems to be both shorter, so that's the, the IEI, the immune efficacy with regard to infectiousness, it's not as infectious, and disease is more mild, then that's this IEP. So I'll show you a little bit of data that supports this. This is actually from SARS-CoV-2. So we're now just at the point really where we can start to see some of how immunity wanes because we're just getting to a point where people have been infected. People were infected long enough ago that we can see what happens after, you know, as time passes. So this was a study by Dan et al um, from Shane Crotty's group out in California. And they look at five different components of immunity to SARS-CoV-2. So it's IgG, B cells, CD4, T cells, CD8, T cells, and IgA. The black dots show people who had all five, were positive for all five components of immunity. And then these pink dots you can see are positive for four components of immunity. Um, Uh, different ones are missing in, in, different, in different individuals here. But um, at any rate, what you see is that at one to two months, the majority of people have all five components of this kind of specific immunity. And by five to eight months, those same people have less. So not as many people have all five components. Most people have four, three, have, sorry, four or three components, and a few people have just two components. Um, and what exactly these molecular and cellular aspects of immunity, how that translates to functional immunity, we don't yet know, but this does suggest this kind of immunity as a dimmer switch. So there's this kind of very strong, the light is on full, and then it's waning, it's dimming a little bit, and exactly what this means for transmission and disease, we are not entirely sure. Um, just to kind of compare this for a second, you can see that different infections have very different rates of loss of immunity. And I just want to highlight for a second some of these that we have very strong childhood vaccination campaigns for, like measles, and what we see is that loss of immunity takes a very, very long time for something like that. So that seems pretty different. We don't have exactly these kind of data because we don't have that kind of longitudinal data from SARS-CoV-2 yet. Um, but this is a very slow decay of immunity in contrast with what we seem to be seeing from SARS-CoV-2, which is certainly more rapid. So just to kind of, because this, this is from Callow et al, 1990, this is this reinfection, re-exposure study that they did. I, I just wanna kind of highlight some of the aspects of it that I think are really key. So first of all, to orient you to what's going on here, the solid black dots, there, there's um, I think 15 individuals. It's a fairly small sample size. The solid, they, they get, everybody gets an exposure. So this is a, a pre-time point. Oh, nasal IgA, so actually nasal swabs up here and systemic IgG down here. Uh, there is a pre-time point. So the very first, the time point all the way on the left, you can see that the, the open dots uh, are overall have higher titers than the closed dots. And at the first time point, just following that, they're all exposed to, they're infected um, via their nose with 229E, one of the endemic coronaviruses. And these different groups, they're grouped by what happens upon that first exposure. So on that first exposure, the, uh, the black dot group gets infected and uh, the, the white or the open dot group does not get infected. So it kind of seems sensible that what is happening here is that if you had higher titers to start with, you don't get an infection. If you have lower titers to start with, IgA or IgG, systemic or nasal, you, you do get infected. Okay. And the kinetics are kind of, uh, oh, 
Yeah, the kinetics are a little bit interesting. So one thing that I note, and this is a little bit of a tangent, but is I think relevant to a lot of future, so this idea of um, immune efficacy with regard to susceptibility and the possibility of sterilizing immunity. So this white group here, this the open circles, um, they were the ones who had what we might think of as sterilizing immunity, presumably from a prior infection because this circulates widely. And what we see is they don't get any boost in their IgG, but they do get, and what is at least in this very small sample size, a statistically significant boost in IgA titers in their nodes, which is uh, intriguing in suggesting that perhaps these nasal IgA titers actually help provide that sterilizing immunity, which may be fairly short lasting. Um, in the group that does get infected, we see kind of typical antibody kinetics about a week after infection, there are antibodies, their systemic antibodies and their IgA in the nose start increasing, and then everybody slowly decays over time. And what we see here, just notice that this is a big break. So these are in days on the left side of the x axis, and in weeks all the way out to 52 weeks. So this is a year on the right side of the axis. At this time point, they re-expose everybody. So the open circle group and the closed circle group, people who got infected at the beginning and people, people who got infected at the beginning and people who didn't. And what they see, oh, I didn't write it here, I'm sorry. What they see is that um, everybody who didn't get infected at the beginning gets infected a year later. So that seems like if you had sterilizing immunity at time zero, you no longer have it a year later. And two thirds of the people who got infected at the beginning get infected a second time a year later. So it starts to give us some notion of how long does this sterilizing immunity last? And this is actually just to show you, um, this is from Galanti and Shaman, and it's showing the times to reinfection of OC43 and HKU1, which are the two uh, endemic beta coronaviruses. And again, you can see within a year, you're getting a decent chunk of people um, who were infected with one of them are reinfected a year or so later, 20% uh, or so for HKU1, and all the way up to like 50% for OC43. Um, to be noted, these are all asymptomatic infections identified in adults. So this is just from proactive nasal swabbing. It's not because these people were getting sick. Interestingly, uh, there is one of the things that's we we have. So we have these data from the endemic coronaviruses, which tell us something about what happens when coronaviruses are endemic in the human population. And then we also have this really interesting source of data from SARS-CoV-1. So for SARS-CoV-1, we actually have data on what happens in the absence of re-exposure because it was eradicated. And so there's a cohort of people who were infected with SARS-CoV-1 about 20 years ago. And now we see over time what's happened to their immunity. And so uh, both this Yang et al. and Labert in 2005, and then now just very recently in 2020, uh, look at how B cells sort of the same component, the same components of immunity that I was showing you for SARS-CoV-2 in the Dan et al. paper, um, how they wane with time and, and B cells and antibodies seem to wane more rapidly and T cells, um, CD8 T cells they're finding provide, uh, well, sorry, T cells, specific T cells last longer and they are still responsive. So these are in vitro studies, of course, because people aren't getting reinfected with SARS-CoV-1. Um, but in the absence of re-exposure without any boosting, there is still some T cell immunity. So again, we're looking at all of these different components of immunity, molecular and cellular components of immunity, and we're asking the question, and then we're also seeing some of the functional aspects of immunity, and we don't fully know how those two things relate to each other, uh, but we can start to make some guesses. So now, uh, we want to take a look. One other really important source of data is data on zero surveys. And this helps us identify how much are the endemic coronaviruses circulating. The mean age of infection is often used as a way of sort of identifying the force of infection, which tells us something about how transmissible a particular pathogen is and um, 
how much it is in the population in a sense. So uh, we the green dots here are showing IgG titers and the purple dots are IgM. And we focus a lot on these IgM titers. So the, oh, I think if I go to the next slide. Yeah, so the IgG stays high, as you can see, for all four of these. There's some dips in some of them, but, but they generally stay pretty high through adulthood um, for all four for all four strains. And we believe that that's because people are re-exposed relatively frequently and keep boosting those titers. Um, in contrast, what you see with IgM is that it that people uh, have young children have high IgM titers or get IgM titers, and then IgM titers decay and are consistently gone throughout adulthood. And the reason for this is that IgM typically is only elicited when your immune system recognizes like a new epitope. So that might be a fully new pathogen or a pathogen that has evolved such that it's antigenically distant enough from the previous version of it. Um, so what this suggests is that people are getting, everyone is infected for the first time. Oh, also, sorry, I should say IgM titers wane much more quickly than IgG. So they wane within about six months. And that makes these IgM data really useful for estimating the age of primary infection, because in a sense, uh, the, the data are showing us what proportion of the population was infected within the past six months and had a primary infection within the past six months. And what we and so we get this really very pretty kind of kind of curve we might expect for uh, the ages of first infection for an infection that is either super 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 transmissible so that would be like a crazy high R naught infection or an infection that has a more sort of normal R naught but has a lot of circulation because it's also being transmitted by the by infections in older individuals. So we use this IgM as an indicator of primary infection and calculate the mean age of primary infection from these data. Um, and given that, what we find is that the mean age of infection for all four of them is somewhere in the range of about four to five years. Uh, and that suggests that in a perfectly well mixed population, in a sense, that would suggest that everyone is getting infected every four or five years. Um, Probably in probably with uh, with adults, it, it may be longer than that. You know, the tra transmission rates just because of contact patterns are much higher here. But certainly that's very rapid. And um, we do expect and we have other data that suggest that, as we saw, that adults get reinfected pretty frequently. But we rarely see pathology in adults, suggesting that all of these reinfections in adulthood are basically asymptomatic. Um, so given all of these notions of what the interactions between human immunity and the, in, and the coronaviruses is like, what do we think is going to happen with COVID in the future? So this was a study published by Kistler and all from Mark Lipsitch's group um, very early on in the pandemic, back in May, I think. Um, and they use an SEIRS model. So they take into account the idea that immunity wanes relatively rapidly. So here they assume it lasts about 40 weeks. Here it might last for two years. And what you're seeing here is that these, these gray lines are, so the red and you can see the red and blue are the other, the endemic beta coronaviruses. The gray lines are COVID 2 And what this sort of looks like is that we're gonna, COVID 2 is gonna stick around. Um, and we may well have these very large epidemics. We have a pretty high level of infection of OC43 and HKU1 every year or every other year, depending on exactly where you are, et cetera. But people are getting infected with these all the time. And this is predicting that people are going to get infected with COV2 even more than that, which at first glance seems pretty scary. Um, that we would be having out five years from now these very large outbreaks, not just this first giant peak, but these large outbreaks due to waning of immunity in the future. If immunity lasts a little longer, they get smaller, but still not fantastic. Um, 
but these models are only looking at transmission. They're not estimating the disease burden. They're just estimating how much SARS-CoV-2 will be circulating. So based on the evidence that we've gotten from all of the, the that I've just shown you, there seems to be a short way window of sterilizing immunity, which is what is modeled here, these 40 weeks or two years. But following that, reinfections are less severe and less transmissible or infectious. And what that suggests is that the, the less transmissible or infectious might mean that these are somewhat, these gray peaks would be a little bit lower, but still not hugely different. The really key thing is that if the reinfections are less severe, while we may be seeing these rather large peaks into the future, because these peaks are driven by reinfections, by secondary infection, if primary infection provides protection, maybe they won't be so severe. So let's see what might happen. We develop a model that is, uh, where I'm calling it a functional immunity model. Um, it, it has this property of, so you're, you're, everybody's susceptible at the beginning because this was a virgin epidemic. People become infected um, and recover. And then we have this loss of sterilizing immunity. So this is the same as the model that we were just looking at a moment ago. Uh, and in this second recovered class, which you could also think of as a second susceptible class, people can get reinfected. Um, but these second infections are less infectious. So that's this parameter rho here. The force of infection is defined by uh, beta times the number of infections. And for I2, for these secondary infections, it's multiplied by rho, which is something between zero and one. So secondary infections are less infectious than primary infections. And then we, uh, we, we, make, we start off with the assumption that um, you only get really sick from primary infections, so that uh, the, these secondary infections have low pathology, though, though they can transmit. So the first thing we want to ask is how does this, what would this look like? What does this model predict in an endemic state? Um, if this is the model that fits the endemic coronaviruses, the, the four circulating coronaviruses, can we sort of get a range of parameters for it? Um, so we, as I showed you before, we calculated the mean age of primary infection from uh, from these four different circulating endemic coronaviruses. And we can also calculate the mean age of primary infection predicted by the model at its endemic equilibrium. So when we do that, what we find is that uh, there is evidence that these reinfections are have reduced transmissibility, um, but they are somewhat transmissible. And the reason for that is that what we see here, this sort of whitish band is the age range um, that corresponds to the mean age of primary infection in the data. And what we can see for waning of sterilizing immunity lasting, so this is this is one over, this is like the inverse of years. So this up here suggests that immunity lasts only six months. This down here suggests it lasts two years. And that seems to be toward the upper end of what people think is plausible for how long fully sterilizing immunity lasts. And so if we're looking at this white band above this black line, so sterilizing immunity lasts less than two years um, for an R0 of five, so this is already a relatively, uh, relatively high R0, what we're seeing is that secondary infections need to have, so this is now showing how, how infectious are secondary infections. Zero says they don't transmit at all. One says they're as infectious as primary infections. And what we see from this is that there's this band here uh, that is, that, and, and it shifts with R0. So you can see for R0 for, of two, it shifts significantly to the right. But regardless, um, it, it is somewhere between zero and one. So for plausible, what seem to be plausible values of omega of this waning of sterilizing immunity, um, which we're, we're taking to be above this line here, and plausible values of R naught, 
it is the secondary infections are neither at zero. So this white band doesn't span zero and it it is unlikely to be all the way up at one, though for low levels of R0, it can be pretty close. So all of that in kind of plain English is that uh, reinfections are transmissible, but not quite as transmissible. So that's that row parameter we look like, um, that we look at. And I guess I said it, yeah. Conclusions, immunity is not all or nothing. People immu whose immunity has waned can be reinfected and transmit, but less than primary infections. Okay. So we now wanna take all of that information and apply it to us. We're gonna make the assumption for the moment that the basic model of immunity, not the specific parameters. So we're gonna vary R naught. We're gonna vary the duration of immunity. We're gonna vary how transmissible secondary infections are. But the basic structure of the model of immunity for SARS-CoV-2 is similar to that for the endemic coronaviruses. And we wanna ask, what what will disease look like in the future given a very important observation about uh, the age specific infection fatality ratio so this has to do with how severe disease is this is looking at how severe is primary disease so primary infection and it's showing for cove 2 mers and cove 1. so what we see for cove 2 and cove 1 so cove 2 is the red line cove yeah, COVE-2 is the red line, COVE-1 is the blue line. Um, they're extremely mild in young children. They both increase in severity into adulthood, COVE-1 hugely. So it has very, very high case fatality and infection fatality ratio in older people. Uh, COVE-2 that we're experiencing right now, obviously this is, even though this looks pretty mild in comparison, as we saw at the very beginning, given the huge number of infections, this is causing massive health burden at the moment. Um, so it goes up, the age specific infection fatality ratio increases with age, but not to the same extent as SARS-CoV-1. MERS, in contrast, Mideastern Respiratory Syndrome has a completely different shape. And the key thing here is that it is high in young children. And so we want to look at how these age specific infection fatality ratio curves interplay with that model of immunity that we were looking at. And just to kind of um, put this, you know, give a little bit of an update with what we currently know about infection fatality ratios for SARS-CoV-2, there's actually quite a wide variety of infection fatality ratios globally um, as they've been measured in different places. So this blue line here, I didn't do the colors very well. This blue line is from China, is from Verity et al. And that's actually the same as this red line. So that's the COVE-2 line here. You can see that estimates from New York City were a little bit higher. Estimates from India, from Mumbai and Karnataka were significantly lower, just sort of an interesting observation. And we can wonder why. But the key thing to note about all of these SARS-CoV-2 age-specific in age infection fatality ratio curves is that in young children, whether you're looking at the more severe or the less severe in young children, it's always very mild. So now we're going to take the, the model, the transmission model we had, we're going to put age on top of it. So we use the age demographics of the US population, and we want to look at how the age distribution of primary infections changes with time. And then we're going to overlay those age specific infection fatality ratio curves we just looked at and assess how much disease burden will there be. So first, let's just look. This is not looking at disease burden. This is just the model prediction of the age distribution of cases over time. This sort of salmon colored area is cases in zero to 10 year olds and then age increases as you get down to, you know, this kind of like magenta color down at the bottom. So for regardless of R naught, at the beginning of the epidemic, the age distribution of cases in this model, because it's a well-mixed model, the age distribution of cases just mirrors the age distribution of the population. So you can see, uh, you know, basically like, there's not as many older people because they've died before they got to that age. But other than that, you know, it's, it's a fairly even distribution across the younger part of the population. Okay. 10 years out, so when we look at the end, regardless of R0, uh, 
the vast majority of cases are in young children. So this space is almost all taken up by salmon 10 years out in all three of these panels. The slower the spread, so a lower R naught, it takes, for a slower spread, it takes longer to get to the steady state demographics of infection. And that means it takes longer to get to this place where almost all primary infections are in young children. So you can, you can clearly see for R naught equals six, this happens really quickly which is basically almost everyone in the population is infected within this first year, pretty much. For R0 equals four, it takes a little bit longer. It takes maybe more like two to three years. And for R0 equals two, it's taking a little bit over 10 years to really get to those steady state demographics because the infection is spreading more slowly. The key thing about this, as I said, this is looking at the ages of primary infection. If in the model we're assuming that um, disease, that a primary infection provides long lasting disease, uh, immunity against disease, disease reduction. And um, so as primary cases become almost entirely in children and the elderly are no longer getting a primary infection. So people who are aging into this group already got infected before. Um, so they're not getting a primary infection. They might be getting a reinfection as an elderly person. But the primary infections are pretty much all in children. And this suggests that the mean age of primary, uh, sorry, that pathology will overall decrease. So we asked the question, how much is it going to decrease? And in particular, will the, this should say IFR, will the infection fatality ratio reach that of seasonal influenza, which is about 0 0.001? Um, and so here's what we get. We get for COVID, for SARS-CoV-2, you can see uh, for the higher r naughts, the, the dashed lines, Yes, and probably within a decade for a for very slow transmission or for slower transmission, it might take that full decade or a little bit more. Um, and then we can look at that, as I said, this is uh, we can look at it over a, a wider variety of parameters because we don't know for sure. So this is looking over a range of R naughts and now a range of omega. This is omega is the inverse of is it's a measure of how rapidly immunity wanes. So just to orient you again. This up here says immunity wanes very fast, um, which would give us like this is an average of six months of, of sterilizing immunity. This is giving an average of two years of sterilizing immunity. And the, the heat map is showing how long we expect it to take to get to an infection fatality ratio averaged across all the cases at that time. Um, so we're, I do like a six month moving average of the infection fatality ratio. Uh, and how long does it take to get below 0 0.001? And what you can see is that for almost all parameters, it happens within this first decade or so. Um, if if we are down, you know, to a place where it's not transmitting, then of course it doesn't happen, right? So this is R not below one. And um, similarly, if if you have a fairly low R not and immunity lasts a lifetime, you also don't get there. But pretty much any other scenario does get you there. We then ask the question, is this a general prediction for any emerging coronavirus or is this specific to COVID-2? And so it, we see it happens for COVID-2. We also see, interestingly, it happens for COVID-1, even though SARS-CoV-1, as you may recall, has a much higher infection fatality ratio. But it doesn't happen for MERS. And you sh I should note here that this is, I did not plot these very well because um, these three y axes are on different scales. So this green line is actually almost flat. It's not really that MERS is increasing so much. It starts high and it stays high. In contrast, SARS CoV 2 and SARS CoV 1 start high ish. These are in order of magnitude different um, and get much, much, much lower with time. Both of them approaching, you know, less than 0 0.001 as years go by. And this is really because when we put all of this together, we're getting the primary cases are in young children. And so when we get out to the demographic steady state of the infection, the key question is how severe are those cases in children? Cases in adults are all reinfections, at which point people already have some amount of immunity when we're not in this current virgin epidemic. 
Um, and this really strongly depends on an early buildup of this immune efficacy with regard to pathology, disease reduction, immune efficacy that reduces disease during childhood. Uh, and we are assuming in, in the simulations I've shown you thus far, so this is data, these are the results of simulations. The results of these simulations assume that one infection provides uh, protection against death in any subsequent infection. We also consider the possibility that it might take two infections, and we show that the same results basically hold because people are getting infected enough that the first two infections are almost always uh, when people are still fairly young. Um, but of an infection or two does need to provide this long lasting disease reducing immunity for this to happen. The other thing that I think is really key to note is that um, immune senescence may still come into play. So I showed you at the very beginning that there were some deaths from OC43, one of the endemic coronaviruses in the elderly. And that could be because uh, as people are getting older, their, their immune system just doesn't work as well and doesn't protect them as much, combined with the fact that they may be more isolated, so the time between infections may be longer. And perhaps um, while this model assumes that IEP lasts forever after your first infection or two, it may be that it wanes, but much more slowly. And if it went more slowly than IES or IEI, that is to say, you have protection against disease much longer than you have protection against transmission. And if that's the case, then it matters. It actually is helpful to come into contact with the pathogen relatively frequently so that your immunity is updated. Um, just to kind of show you, since we're asking these questions right now about what should we be doing to, to deal with SARS-CoV-2, uh, one of the things we think about is, sh should we be treating vaccination of it like we do other infectious diseases? And, and so I showed you that measles, and I'm just gonna focus on measles for a moment. So I showed you that immunity to measles seems to wane very, very slowly. So people retain it almost for a lifetime. And additionally, these infections in young children, you can see unlike SARS-CoV-2 or SARS-CoV-1, where it's flat, there's very low infection fatality ratio in young children. In measles, you get this much higher, uh, you get a little uptick in infection fatality ratio in young children. And those two things combined mean that the fact that immunity wanes slowly for measles means it's possible to generate herd immunity and local eradication. And the fact that you get this uptick in young children means that it's important to do it. And SARS-CoV-2 is different in both of those ways. Okay, I'm gonna skip that. Um, I'm gonna go just sort of talk through this real quick. Uh, we, we show that really the important thing is to get the vaccine out as fast as possible before transmission rates go up. And after that, it may not really be necessary to keep vaccinating people. So uh, here we're showing that keeping transmission rates down, I mean, this is very obvious, I'm sure you all are aware of this, but keeping transmission rates down close to R naught equals one uh, really slows the beginning of the epidemic and decreases the number of deaths hugely, not too surprising. The result of that, given the model that we're looking at, we're now looking at lives saved annually. And so if you look at for COVID, we're showing what year do you introduce the vaccine? So this is the time of vaccine introduction, either after emergence, or if you maintain R0 close to one until you bring the vaccine in, the results are pretty much the same for the introduction of the vaccine at the start of rapid spread or right before rapid spread, ideally. So what that shows is if you start vaccinating, um, before it starts spreading rapidly, so before we lift all the social distancing stuff, you're saving hundreds of thousands of lives. So we're at 500,000 lives up here are saved in, if you, in, in the first year if you introduce it right at the beginning. In contrast, um, if you wait to introduce it, you're really not getting almost any benefit. And similarly, you get very little benefit of continuing to have it. So you can see how this is uh, year four, five, six, up through year 10, you're saving almost no lives at this point. So it's really crucial to get the vaccine out quickly before it starts spreading rapidly or 
as much as that is possible, given that it's already spreading, but we can, it still has certainly not uh, infected, you know, there's lots of populations that, that still have vast um, numbers of naive individuals. Um, and then just to, you could kind of contrast that with that with MERS, which uh, we were saying has that high infection fatality ratio in young children and continued vaccination continues to save hundreds of thousands of lives. So in summary, uh, immunity to the coronaviruses, including SARS-CoV-2, erodes with time, but protection against severe disease may be long lasting. Primary cases in children are tend to not be very deadly. Primary cases in adults, of course, especially those with comorbidities can be deadly, as we know. But in the long run, given all of this, SARS-CoV-2 may be no more virulent than the endemic coronaviruses. It may just turn into the childhood sniffles like any of the other coronaviruses. We're just seeing the virgin epidemic right now. Um, and as primary cases become restricted to children because everyone got infected or vaccinated earlier in life, the overall infection fatality ratio is predicted to become as low as that of seasonal influenza. There are some huge questions left out there. Um, are reinfections or infections post-vaccinations in adults mild? Huge question. How many infections or doses of vaccination are needed for strong and last, lasting, long-lasting disease-reducing immunity? We don't know yet. Will new variants also be very mild in young children? We don't have any evidence to the contrary, which is comforting, but something we definitely need to keep an eye on. And how strong is strain transcending disease reducing immunity? So as new variants are popping up um, and people have immunity either from a prior infection or a vaccine derived from a prior strain, how strong is that immunity, that sort of cross strain immunity? Um, I think I'm gonna leave it at that so that there's a little bit of time for questions. So with that, I'm gonna say thank you so much to all of you guys for listening. Uh, thank you to the whole anti lab group and in particular to Hassan Ahmed and Veronica Zarnitsina for uh, helpful comments. And of course, my co-authors, Rustam Antia and Otar Bjornstad. And I would love to answer any questions that I can. That was brilliant. Thanks. Thanks very much indeed. So if people want to ask questions, they can uh, put their hands up and uh, be unmuted or unmute themselves, or they can put them in the uh, Q&A. Uh, I'll ask uh, uh, one to begin. Um, uh, what do you think the characteristics uh, of original, or the, you know, SARS-1, as it's now called, uh, what were the sort of characteristics of, of that that, uh, that made it different in terms, of that it, in terms of that it could be eliminated on a global scale? Yeah. Well, in some ways, I think the fact that it was more deadly helped. Um, both because it scared people more and there was less asymptomatic transmission. So I think it's it's very hard. I mean, SARS-CoV-1 has been very hard to contain in part because there is so much asymptomatic or very mildly symptomatic transmission. And that's a kind of an interesting um, sort of a trade-off in viral life history evolution. I think people think a lot about this trade-off between virulence and transmission. And in some ways it sort of seems like SARS-CoV-2 hit a fairly sweet spot um, that SARS-CoV-1 was maybe a little too virulent for its own good in some sense. Yeah. And uh, if, anyone, if uh, anyone puts their hands up, then uh, Marie can unmute people if they, uh, if they want to ask uh, uh, questions uh, by voice, as it were. Uh, but uh, uh, if not, uh, you can uh, put them, uh, uh, you, can, you, you, can, you can put them in the, um, in the Q&A. Uh, so an, an, another question for me, uh, in the, you, you talked about um, uh, T-cell uh, immunity, the, the, there was a, a lot of discussion which has faded away uh, initially uh, on, the, um, you know, on, on whether there was any sort of cross, uh, you know, cross reactive immunity, uh, either, um, either a sort of gen just a sort of general um, uh, through, through just general uh, innate immunity status and hence the interest in BCG, et cetera, or through, um, uh, or with seasonal coronaviruses. Um, what do you think the, what, what uh, do, how, 
whilst most of that actually doesn't, there's not that much evidence for any of those things, does that influence uh, how, you, how your models would work? Would those things influence how the models would work? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the cross immunity with other coronaviruses, so maybe specifically with the other beta coronaviruses, for example, which there is some evidence for exactly how much it matters functionally is really up for grabs, but it is clear there is data on um, antibodies that like cross reactive antibody, there are cross reactive antibodies in people that are up, so people who are infected with SARS CoV 2. Uh, do get a boost in antibody titers to some of the other beta coronaviruses at the same time. So it does seem like there, what that means functionally, we don't really know, but there is some degree of that kind of cross, cross immunity. Um, it doesn't change a whole lot about what the model predicts. Uh, it would have, if there's serious cross immunity, then in the endemic state, we might see the same kind of thing that we see with the endemic coronaviruses, which is that you get different years with different dominant strains. Um, and so SARS-CoV-2 could become another one of those things that kind of maybe it would push one of the other strains out, or maybe it would just sort of come into the the, the, the rotation of, of yeah, annual yeah, coronaviruses, but it wouldn't change things hugely. Um, I think the, the other thing, the innate immunity thing you brought up is an interesting question. And I don't really, I don't have a great answer. The only thing I can say that I've been thinking about about it, which is a, more of a question than an answer, is, is that we are seeing some places, I showed those infection fatality ratio curves for SARS-CoV-2 for a number of different locations. And you could maybe, I don't know if you happen to remember, but the ones for Mumbai and Karnataka, so the ones in yeah. India were way lower yeah. and way lower than the US. I didn't put the curve for Brazil in there, but the curve, age infection fatality ratio is similar for Brazil as it is to the US. So people are trying to understand why that is. And some degree of difference in innate immunity maybe would help explain that, but who knows? Yeah, no, that's, 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 that's a great, great, great answer. Um, uh, Danny Dorling's question is, uh, is it better, is it perhaps uh, better or worth considering uh, children uh, not being vaccinated or vaccinated much later uh, to minimise long term mortality if, if the immunity from catching the disease is, uh, is, is as strong or stronger than from the vaccine? So, so you, you were sort That's of talking really about question. facts. Yeah, you, yeah. Yeah, you, you're sort of suggesting you vaccinate kids first at least once. Should, should is there is there a case to not vaccinate kids at all? I, yeah, I don't think I I think that the vaccinating kids once or not vaccinating kids doesn't really make a whole lot of difference in this model, um, and that's because as long as like, unless we were really able to eradicate it, which is not gonna happen with this model. And I think also not gonna happen in real life. Then if you, if, if you vaccinate once, you're still allowing for a lot of circulation of disease, of infection, sorry, not disease, of infection in the long run. And that will keep people's immunity boosted. Yeah. I think that you brought up a really important point in that question, which is, how does vaccine induced immunity differ from infection induced immunity? Um, so you were hearing people say like everything across the gamut right now from like yeah, yeah. vaccines have better immunity to, you know, whatever. I think one, the, the data that I have seen are slightly suggestive. Well, so here's one thing we know. We know that vaccine induced immunity is narrower. Um, that's for sure. It's definitely narrower because the vaccines, at least the ones currently in use in the US, um, only target the spike protein. So, and they don't really elicit, elicit strong CD8 T cell memory. So between those two things, uh, we I think we can say vaccine induced immunity is narrower. Might it be, which, which would suggest that it's less likely to be cross-reactive to other strains. Um, also that it might be less long lasting in a longer term sense because of the lack of CD8 T cells, which do contribute to long lasting memory. 
On the other hand, it does seem to elicit higher immediate antibody titers. So, so there's some trade off there. So maybe it's stronger in the short run, but less broad and maybe not as long lasting. But of course, these are all things to keep measuring because we don't know what, what's going to happen in the long run. But I guess to just sort of bring it back to the initial question, if I would say, and this was kind of one of the things I didn't say at the end of the presentation, it was one of those other little points. It does seem to me that if natural infection provides broader immunity, we would be better off allowing more circulation and especially for young children to be, and the disease stays mild in young children. We would be better off allowing young children to get infected and get this broad strain transcending immunity. But a lot of things to be measured before we really know that. Brilliant. And then uh, the last question, and Marie, if you want to stop recording and, and you need to go, that, that, that's fine. But this, but this will be the last question uh, uh, from uh, Ellen Brooks Pollock uh, asks, the transition to end endemicity that you showed was in the absence of lockdown, presumably. Does your modeling say anything about balancing lockdown and vaccine rollout? Yeah, absolutely. Um, interestingly, so in a, in a sense, our model, those the last couple of figures I showed you, uh, we're showing how changes in R0 affect how rap, I mean, in a sense, lockdown is just limiting R0, right? So most around most places, what, what lockdown is doing is keeping R0 very close to one. It's just going above and below one a little bit as people open up a little bit and then close back down. So we, as we start, you know, open up, start to see a little bit of increase in cases, close back down, R0 goes back down. So that's so so we model that kind of lockdown by R not being approximately one. And there absolutely is a relationship between that and vaccine rollout. Keeping R not close to one at the beginning limits infection before the vaccine is rolled out. And then you roll the vaccine out, and then you that's where I was that graph shows you save hundreds of thousands of lives in that first year after you open up from lockdown in the presence of the vaccine versus the absence of the vaccine. And then in the longer run, continuing to vaccinate doesn't actually continue to save lives is what it looks like. So hopefully okay, that's that question. fascinating. Well, th well, thanks again. It's, it's, it's a shame we can't applaud. Well, we could applaud, but it'd be a bit meaningless <laughs> as everyone's muted. Just be one me clapping. So uh, I really, really like to th uh, 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 thank you very much for that seminar and um, it, it's been recorded and so uh, if, um, if people uh, want to uh, watch it again or want to recommend it to colleagues, friends, etc, uh, then it'll be up on the IEU website uh, by the end of today or by tomorrow at the latest. Uh, so, um, so, so thanks very much uh, uh, Jenny, that was a fantastic thank seminar. Thank you. Thank you all. Take care. Great.